thank you, Kai, for introducing me. Thank you for inviting me and giving me this pleasure to be here in this very interesting and very special place and uh, present the results which were done uh, where the Innsbruck, our uh, group in Innsbruck, was participating on these nanoscale structures. And actually, we now have, uh, which was uh, experimentally observed in JQI and, and, and in NIST in the USA. And then I will, uh, also about the applications of these things, a further application of these things. So um, as, a, as a short motivation, it's kind of almost obvious motivation, yeah? So people are using light for controlling motion and, and uh, position of atoms. And then, of course, you inevitably face with the diffraction limit that limits your special resolution of kind of optical <coughs> potentials that you can create using light. And para paradigmatic ex example of, uh, of these things is these very famous optical lattices. We immediately see that the, the special resolution that you can create is simply lambda over two. And of course the question is, and the motivation was, what can we do to, to overcome this diffractional limit and using light create potential structures, optical potential structures, which has a special resolutions less than lambda over two, what we call sub-wavelength uh, resolution or a nanoscale. And experimentally, they claim they have the, the resolution, so these sizes up to 10 nanometers that can create with normal optical wavelength lasers. Uh, and actually, what afterwards, what we can do with them um, in, in practice, yeah, in experiments. So, uh, so in this talk, this goal will be achieved, and I will be present these results using the atomic lambda system. A theory was done in this paper. An experiment was done in, in this paper, in, in NIST and JQI. Also, there was a, a, another theory paper uh, from Alexei Garshkov a bit later in Fizrafe. I want to say that it's not the only possibility that exists. In, in, and uh, there are also other possibilities that I mentioned here, but in my talk, I will talk about the lambda system because it has also some additional interesting things that I will discuss in the rubric of applications. Yeah? And this, so. so before I start, let me present my collaborators. I don't want to do it at the end, which normally, because in the end, normally you're in a rush, and it's not fair for. So uh, this is our Innsbruck team of Professor Zola, Peter Zola, uh, Hannes Pichli now in, in Harvard with Michael Lukin, and Mateusz Laki, who did actually most of the numerical numerical work is now in, in Krakow, in Poland. And this is uh, JQI and NIST, both theory and experimental team. The head of the theory part is Alexei Garshkov, and the, the, the experimental part are uh, the Trey Porter and Steve Rolston. So what will be uh, exactly in this talk? So this is the outline. First part, actually, the, 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 so it's number one and number two. I will tell you, I will explain you how one can get this type of potential instead of normal sinusoidal one that we are very much familiar with. Yeah? So, and then I will discuss, so you see you get a lattice, still you get a lattice, periodicity lambda over two, but the, instead of sinus you have here very thin and very high barriers. So then I will uh, talk about the, what are the single particle properties in this sort of lattice system which are used then in experiments to just justify and, 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 and sort of uh, support this theory. And this would be the largest part of the talk. Then I briefly mention what could be interest in many body uh, physics, what kind of interest in many body physics can be done, and also few body physics. If you have dipole-dipole interaction, which uh, for, for, for some of you would be an interesting story, there is some interesting things that come uh, because of these structures. And then I will jump to applications. I mentioned three. One kind of very obvious, clears such a potential thin and high looks like a knife. Yeah, so you can use it as a cutting tool for your cloud or whatever to cut it in two with a very small special separation between the parts. Less obvious things, you can see this as a pencil and you can move it very quickly, yeah, uh, uh, changing maybe its height, or maybe just 
with a different speed to engineer potential of other type in a stroboscopical sense. So you move it very fast, what you average over this period of these fast oscillations, and that's what you get. In principle, you can generate potential of any form with a special resolution given by the size of this peak. Yeah? And not obvious application is how you can use the ideas behind the scheme to get a scanning atomic microscope where you can scan the wave function in a continuum way or in a destructive way or in a continuum way, scan the wave function, for example, that sits in a, in a, in a, in a single uh, cell or a single minima of your uh, standard optical lattices, these one-year functions, for example. Yeah. This will be the less trivial example. I will have some couple of slides on this. Yeah. Okay, so let's start. How to get from a lambda system, how to use a lambda system to create potential like this. Let me just, I hope most of you know, but still let me remind you to introduce the proper notations. So here, so lambda system, uh, we need a two ground state, so it's an atom. And we use three levels of this atom. One, uh, two of them are ground state or, or long living state. I will call them ground state, G1, G2. And one excited states, which are coupled in this way with two laser beam. One would be control field, which would be strong. And another one would be weak field, which is a probe field. Yeah? So now I will, next slides. Uh, um, uh, and, and it's here, it's actually, it doesn't matter for the further construction whether I'm, these two are on resonance with this level or off resonance. But you will see that it's actually a very convenient tool, this detuning, uh, to, to how you, you see that, that the properties of the system changes not so trivially with respect to this detuning. Yeah? So now I will explain you how to organize this lambda system in such a way that the atoms in a dark state in this lambda system experience optical potentials of that type. Yeah? So uh, the configuration of atomic motion, let me consider one dimensional motion, assuming that the other two dimensions, transverse dimensions are very strongly confined with some traditional optical lattices. Such atom can move only in one direction. Uh, let me call it X. And then as a weak probe field, I put the laser field perpendicular to this direction. That actually means that uh, my omega p, the Rabi frequency of this uh, coupling, is a constant, x independent. Yeah? So there is no dependence on x. On the other hand, my control field, which would be strong, I organize as a standing wave. So that means I send two beams from both sides. And therefore, my control field would be sinusoidal in space with very higher amplitude, such that I have the following lambda system. Yeah? So this is a weak constant prop field, and this is sinusoidal, and with a large amplitude control field. A weak and, and strong means that the ratio of this omega p to the amplitude of omega c, I will call it epsilon, and please remember this, this epsilon will follow us through the entire story today, yeah, is much less than one. This is controlling parameter in this case, uh, together with the k, the wavelength, the wave vector of the uh, control field of the standing wave along the motion of atoms. Important condition here to have a dark state, mean dark state, that state does not decay, because otherwise it, 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 it's not so interesting. Yeah? If you have decaying state, it's not so interesting. So, uh, to have these two photon resonant conditions. So that means with absorbing and emitting these photons, these two ground state that normally has different energies becomes energetically degenerate. Yeah? So, but again, as I said, detuning can be arbitrary. You don't need, you can be on resonance. You will still have a dark state, which is not decaying, but you can be detuned. And in some <coughs> cases, you better be detuned. You will see why. No? So this is, this is important conditions. So otherwise, what people say, you will have a gray state, which will be slowly decay depending on this grayness. OK, so now what is the Hamiltonian of this system? It's one dimensional motion. I have one dimensional kinetic energy. And then I have internal part, internal Hamiltonian, this atomic Hamiltonian, which I write, wrote here in, this, in, the, in, in the rotating frame. Yeah? where you see these two ground states, which are now degenerate, 
Yeah? And the Rabi frequencies, they couple these uh, ground state to the excited states. It is this transition. And for the excited states, what I have, I have minus detuning plus imaginary part, which is roughly decay yeah? in those lifetime of these excited states. Yeah. So this is my Hamiltonian I'm working with. So here I have sinus, here I have constant. Let's see uh, what are the properties of this stuff. And let's first, of course, let's uh, consider the adiabatic approximation where we neglect kinetic energy. And just looking, what are the eigenstates of this internal atomic Hamiltonian as a function of position? Yeah? So we, of course, diagonal is a three by three matrix. It's easy to diagonalize even without computer. So that's kind of doable exercise. Once, uh, so, and then what you get, you will get a dot state, which has zero eigen energy. So independent on position, it's a zero eigen energy of this matrix. And it's only including it two ground states, yeah, G1 and G2, nothing else, no excited states. That means that is uh, physically, this is combination of ground state which destructively interfere into excited states. So therefore, there is no excited states, no decay. That's why dark state. The other two eigenstates, which are called bright states, they have excited states in them. So therefore, they decay. So there you see them through the light decay. That's why they're called bright states. Uh, they have some eigen energies. Yeah? And, 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 and the measure part is non-zero, indicating that these are decaying states. And this angle alpha, which actually tells you what is the spatial decomposition of your dark state when you move along the x, it's simply arctangent of the ratio of the Rabi frequencies. And because this one changes in space, yeah, and the amplitude is very large, so roughly speaking, this angle varies from minus pi over 2 to pi over 2. Yeah? So uh, uh, as a kind of uh, illustration, how the spectrum of adiabatic eigen energies looks like. Yeah, I, I, I draw here a very simple case where detuning is zero, gamma is zero, so just don't worry about the measuring parts. Then the spectrum is, of course, symmetric. And then you have a dark state, which has everywhere different energy. But of course, depending on position, have a different decomposition, yeah? because it's the sinus L on X and cosinus L on X. And these are the energies of the bright states. So the gap between the dark and the bright state is given by the smallest Rabi frequency, smallest probe frequency omega p, and the amplitude amplitude is, is very large. It's omega c, which is the largest one. So here. So this is the structure of adiabatic eigenstates, well, in this simple case. No? So of course, if you have different detuning, the thing starts moving, slightly changing their origin, and moving back and forth if detuning is very large, positive or negative, one of these things becomes standard optical potential, another would be pushed. Yeah, so, um, so this is adiabatic state uh, structure, yes? So what is the random group G1, G2 in there? Uh, it is um, this decomposition. You see, when I move in space, my omega c changes because it's sinus, alpha changes, and therefore, uh, uh, it, I, I, will come, I will come later to this, yeah, in, in a bit more details. So now, let's look closely to the structure of the dark state. It's exactly to this question. Yeah? So this is, again, internal structure, angle, and the uh, energy zero. So now let me look at the, how Rabi frequencies looks in space. So this is my x. This is my control field, which has a very large amplitude, probe field, is a constant. And then I see, because the amplitude of the control field is very large, in almost, almost everywhere, these are the red areas here, my amplitude of my control field, sorry, here must be the, the modulus, is much larger than omega p, the probe field. So therefore, arctangent is very close to pi over 2. And only in these blue regions, I have omega c much smaller than omega p or smaller, that means my alpha close to zero. Yeah? And, and, and the size of these blue areas from a very simple geometrical consideration is actually given by epsilon. Yeah? 
The smaller the epsilon, the smaller this area is. Yeah? And therefore, if you take epsilon point 0.1, this area would be one, th whatever, with pi, so fraction of, of a lambda over 2. So it means really very narrow regions. And the, the width controlled by epsilon. And then if you look here, when alpha changes from pi over 2 roughly to 0, you see that the, the, the structure of the dark state changes from G2 yeah, to G1, G2, G1. And this G1 exists only in these very narrow regions. And in the adiabatic approximation, this eigenstate has a zero energy, which, of course, uh, kind of very uh, suspicious, yeah? because nature doesn't like quick changes for free. Yeah? It doesn't allow this. So and this, indeed, what you can very easily check. And of course, changes means kinetic energy. Yeah? That's what we throw away at the moment. So if we now take into account kinetic energy in a very simplest form as a first order perturbation theory, and this turns out to be the, the, the exact answer, which I will give you later on using some more sophisticated math, what you will get that energy cost for these changes yeah, is actually given by this. Yeah? And you see, this is a very special function for epsilon being very small, because if you are in the position where sinus is not close to 0, you can forget epsilon squared here. Cosmos is roughly 1. So you have something recoil energy times epsilon squared. And epsilon is small, so it is practically 0. Huh? But on the other hand, in the regions where sinus kx is very small or zero, yeah, and small as zero compared to epsilon, yeah, you see that I can neglect sinus, because sinus squared is one, and I have epsilon squared divided by epsilon squared to the fourth power. So that means recoil divided by epsilon squared. So that's exactly these peaks that appears for the dark state as a kind of non-adiabatic correction due to internal change of the dark state, internal decomposition. And these are really looks, these are just numerical plot of these things. They, they have uh, the width L, which is controlled by epsilon, and the height is roughly 1 over L squared, normally from quantum mechanics. So that's why it's 1 over epsilon squared. So peaks are narrow and higher. And again, this is because my dark state changes when I move in space, from one internal state quickly to another, and then back. And this generates for you this potential. This is a key kind of idea behind all this. Yeah? So that is why if I have my very strong standing wave, very weak, constant Rabi frequency, then I immediately generate for the dark state for the bright state, they also appear, but we are not interested in bright states in the first place. They are decaying. We immediately, for the dark state, we generate this type of potential automatically. So here, quickly, what are the features of these potentials and kind of advantages to compare to some other methods, not all, but other methods for generating these uh, structures with subwave wave resolution? First of all, well, it's always repulsive, yeah, because it's roughly a matrix element of the kinetic energy, and kinetic energy is always positive. Unfortunately, you cannot create these negative such things to carry the particles there. No, it doesn't work. Yeah? So it's always repulsive peaks. Yeah? Second, it's actually more geometrical construction. So that means this potential depends on the ratio epsilon of the Rabi frequencies, and of course, recoil energy. But that means ratio of the Rabi frequencies for experiments, it's a big advantage because you, take, you can make these uh, two beams using the frequency modulation from the same source. So you take the beam from one source, you split it in two, and modulate the frequency such that these omega p and omega c, they all have the same fluctuation amplitudes and a phase amplitude fluctuations. But the ratio remains. So that means this gives these peaks, they're very robust. They're not shaking like crazy, even if the phase of the laser field fluctuates. Yeah? And of course, advantage compared to some of the other schemes, that this is a far field. You have no surfaces nearby. You don't have decay related to the surfaces that nearby. So it's, it's really inside somewhere your working chamber. You don't need to go close to the surface. OK, so now let me say, few words about the experiments, how 
do the people in, in, in JQI and NIST implement these Lambda schemes, which, which actually not so, not, not uh, the things that you can get for free. Yeah? So they consider this fermionic iterbium uh, uh, 171. Uh, it has a, a, a nuclear spin one half, two electrons. So that means ground state is a, a, one as zero, so spin singlet. But, uh, and, but the nuclear spin is one half. So you have just doublet here, plus minus one half. Then, then you have the excited state, which is 3p1. And it is, uh, with a hyperfine splitted, into f3 half and f1 half. And hyperfine splitted, so here's all the parameters that you have uh, in terms of the, the width of this line. No, this is here, given here. So that means hyperfine splitting, if you multiply, you would get some few gigahertz, which is typical for these heavy atoms. So now, uh, they, so therefore, this is kind of far in energy, although for, for real numerics fitting the experiments, we still have to take this into account. Yeah. And so to, to isolate from these two doublets lambda system, they apply magnetic fields, 120 Gauss. That means this is split very slowly, very little, because this is nuclear magnetic moment. So this is splitting of this in here doublet, ground state doublet. But this one splits substantially, because this is electron magnetic moment, yeah? no orbital momentum. Yeah? So here splitting is, I guess, 100 megahertz. This, this splitting. So therefore, these three levels form the lambda system. Yeah? So here, for the control field, they have a sigma minus. For the pi, for the probe field, they use a pi polarization. This is a weak one. They also, they, they, as I said, they use the, the, this they made from the same source with the frequency modulation. And, and here, they, they, these, these things is actually important for, for them and for the experiments because uh, with, uh, with, you have to compensate the AC Stark shift for all other states which are not participating in the lambda system. It is there, yeah? but you can compensate it by some detuning frequency in order to have these two photon resonant condition, to have a, a dark state and not the gray state. Yeah? So these are some uh, technical things. Yeah. And in their case, um, uh, they can vary the, the control, control field roughly 100 uh, gamma. Yeah, you can, so to say, uh, see what it is. It's, uh, yeah, uh, around megahertz. Yeah. And, uh, and the omega p is from 5 to 20 gamma, so that means epsilon uh, from 120 to 150. Yeah, ranges, this epsilon. Yeah. And they walk in a trap, which is kind of a cigar type. Yeah. And they have kind of initially a uh, few hundred thousand atoms. They sympathetically cool with rubidium to the temperature, which is 1.1 T Fermi. So with, for them, it would be enough. At some point, I will come back to this temperature. You will see why it was important. Yeah? So what you expect from the experiment is, so this is kind of system uh, um, potentials, these barriers that they expected to have. Yeah, this is sigma minus standing wave, this control field. This pi field is a, is a probe field. These sort of barriers they expect to have. And these barriers just you have to apply to your cigar that you have in your trap. And this is what kind of it should look like. This is modulus of control field. This is a probe field. And this is more mag magnified by 40 times these barriers that you should create. Yeah? They estimated the size of the barrier 10 nanometers for epsilon point 0.1, so somewhere in the middle of their range. Yeah? And then what they observe also, but I'll come back later, just to demonstrate it's a dark state. Yeah? So the lifetime, it's 44 milliseconds. It's on resonant, we're here on resonant, so it's approximately, a, approximately 100,000th time larger than the lifetime of, of atom in, in, in a free space. So it's really dark state, it's really dark state. So now, um, uh, let me give you more math, just to give you some feeling what you get and what you can test then, what you get properties for 
atoms in such potentials, which you can then test, and they did test in the experiments. Yeah? So, so here, of course, the convenient way is to use this uh, born up in Heimer eigenstates of your internal Hamiltonian, dike and bright states, which change in, in space. So you decompose your state in, in, in these three pieces. So these are the wave function for the dark state and wave function for the bright state, which position depend and time dependent. And you want to write the Schrodinger equation for this wave function, yeah, take into account kinetic energy. But of course, because the, the basis vectors changes in space, there would be some derivatives, non-zero non derivatives, so you expand them, so it's a kind of standard math that you get, and the Hamiltonian that you get will look like this. If you do this math, the Hamiltonian looks like this. This is a connection matrix. It actually tells you how derivatives of the basis vector are expect, expanded in terms of basis vectors, again. Yeah? And this is our diagonalized internal part. This is our dark state, and this is two bright states. This is our internal part, which is diagonal in this basis. And this is sort of cost for position dependence. So now if you do math with your particular uh, form of the dark and bright states, you get some matrix, explicit form. So here, just to simplify things, I present this very special case, no detuning, gamma zero. So then the matrix has a, a nice form like this. And it depends only on one parameter, how this phase, remember this tangent phase equals the ratio of the rubber frequencies, which varies from minus pi over two to pi over two, on its spatial derivative. That's the only thing that appears. Yeah. And this, again, has similar structure because it's epsilon here and epsilon squared here plus sinus squared. Again, when sinus squared is not close to zero, it's although the k epsilon, small, but when sinus is zero, it's k over epsilon, and it's large. So it has this structure. Yeah. And this part we already know. It's this thing. So let's now see how this modifies our... Um, uh, uh, born up in Heimer thing. So you expand, yeah, square, and this is what we started before. This is the adiabatic part. Now we have linear part in alpha prime that you see that couples the bright states with the dark states, yeah, because this is called this. These blocks are for the for the dark state, and the rest is a bright state. So you see there is a coupling between them, and this is again part which has here doesn't couple bright to dark. So there is a dark contribution and there is bright contribution. And we are focused on the dark state contribution, then we exactly recover our barriers. This is our this non-adiabatic potential. So now derived in a more rigorous way, if you say, not just to take an expectation value of the kinetic energy like what would you do in the first order perturbation field. So in a sense, that was an exact answer that I advocated already. Important thing is that here it's a conservative potential. Uh, and second important thing, it has the same form in a general case. Yeah, you should believe me. So if you take a more general case with detuning, with gamma, this part, dark state contribution, will have the same form. You can argue it with this, some sort of completeness of the basis, et cetera, et cetera, but it has the same form, independently of detuning and gamma. So peaks remains peaks, whatever detuning you take. Yeah? And of course, the first things you do, you just neglect these things, and you can do it under some conditions, which actually in experiments almost <coughs> fulfilled, at least for part values of epsilon. That means that the height of your potentials should be less than the gap between the dark and the bright states. Yeah? So these potentials do not touch for the path values of epsilon. This, this is a good approximation. So you just neglect this, and if you focus on a dark state only, yeah, because in this they are not coupled, yeah, what you get, you get a very interesting Hamiltonian, which you know from a textbooks, yeah, almost. Yeah, you have a kinetic energy. That's a Schrodinger equation for the dark state wave function. Kinetic energy and this periodic optical potential on the form of a very uh, narrow peaks, which is called cronin penny model. No? So now what before was just a straight line here. If you zoom it, you will see potential so that high uh, form, which are narrow and a, and a higher. And there is a special relation between. Yeah? Uh, 
Uh, and then, of course, if you have potential of that kind, you open the textbooks, you know, okay, this is periodic potential, bloch, wave function, bloch, bands, and all with the name bloch appears here. Okay? And that's what we did. You can actually calculate things with this potential uh, practically analytically for the at least lower bands here. It is not the delta function type, so you have to do some job. Yeah, so it's not that simple as a delta function. It's stronger than a delta function, this picks. But anyway, you get the spectrum, you get the bands, and you get the wave functions. And what is very interesting for the spectrum, yeah, for, the, for the bands, is that it's, it's a center of the band. You see it's n squared. n is an integer, 1, 2, 3, etc. The band has a width which is proportional to epsilon. Yeah? Of course, epsilon small, band small. And then you have standard cosinus structure, which are very typical to the tight binding approximation, which you get in the lattice when the atom just tunnel from one side to another side, etc. Then you get cosine. So here it's very similar. However, the, the picture is different. Eh? If you look carefully on this position of the, of the um, center of the bands, you see that this is exactly levels in this infinitely deep square well. Yeah? That's exactly the wave functions here in this, if you forget about the rest, then I get exactly these structures. So the picture is I have these infinitely deep potential wells which are weakly coupled by these barriers. And that's if you look at the wave function, it looks, it supports this picture very nicely. So you have this almost sinu half sinusoidal here for the, for the ground state. And then they couple slightly by this barrier. So now you have, in a the, in the sinusoidal, you have the wave functions located in the minima with the, with the large and broad barrier and you tunnel through. Yeah? But here you, you don't have, you have these boxes nearby. The wave functions are almost everywhere. And then there is a very thin barrier in between. Yeah? And this is a very interesting feature, an important feature for the experimental detection. So let me just summarize it. First of all, positions of the band center scales like n squared and not n, what you would have in a very deep sinusoidal potential because it's harmonic yeah? and, the, and the minima. And it's practically epsilon independent for small epsilon. So it does not depend on the height of your potential. Hmm? And a second, because it's n squared, the band gaps, the gaps between the successive bands, grows with n linearly. In a harmonic, deep harmonic confinement, it's a constant. So here it is grows with n. And that's exactly what experimentalists wanted to see. And that's exactly what they saw. Yeah, first of all, they want to see whether there is a, a, a band, a band along this x direction, yeah? So we have lattice only in one direction, so that means only in x direction we have the band. And that's what I said, this was the temperature was exactly right, such that you populate only the lowest band. And this temperature is smaller than the band gap. So all your atoms sits in the lowest band. And then, of course, there is a very standard method for, for detecting this uh, spectrum. So what you do, you do band mapping in time of flight. So what you do, you have your lattice, then you quickly remove the lattice. That means you map your Bloch wave function to the plane waves in this direction. And then you do time of flight, which maps momentum distribution to the positional distribution. Now clear, the faster the particle, the larger momentum the flight goes. And they, what, is, what they see, if they have a lattice in the beginning, they see the, the, the sharp edges in the x direction. In the other direction, in z, there is just this confinement with 100 or whatever hertz harmonic potential. There you see the Gaussian profile, because it's fermions, non-interacting practically, non-interacting fermion. Yeah. But if they do the same configuration, but remove one of the Rabi frequencies such that they don't have these barriers, they see Gaussian profile in both directions. Yeah. Second, what they can do and what they did, they, they, they do this spectroscopy. So you shake this potential at some frequency, and if the frequency of this shaking exceeds the band gap, the particles start be kicked to the next one, and then to the next one, et cetera, et cetera. And then you do this again, time of light band mapping, uh, and, then, and then you actually extract how many particles transferred to another band as a function of frequency, and, 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 and therefore, you more or less know where the next band is. Yeah, and that's what they do for successive four bands, one, two, three, four. 
Yeah, and um, and uh, so this is the picture how they have this band mapping as a function of frequency, and and uh, as a result, what they see, as I told you, yeah, position of the bands is epsilon independent, and they indeed see that the position of the band is epsilon independent, so independent of the height of the potential and width. You do very high potential, it remains the same, which is completely impossible for the sinusoidal one. And then you see, you even, they even have this situation where these barriers uh, penetrate to the, to the um, upper bright states. So it's actually, you need to recalculate things, et cetera, et cetera. Second, what they measure uh, is the, really the band gap scales with n. And they do see the scale. So it, it grows with n. There is some sort of points. They say maybe it's an error of calibration polarization, et cetera, et cetera. But they are clearly not a constant. They are clearly not a constant. They actually fall to this n plus 1 squared minus n squared regime. Yeah? So these are experimental things, the, the experimental points. And this is what you would expect from theory, yeah? knowing the, the gaps, et cetera. So for the next uh, experimental results, I have to, again, come back to theory and analyze the lifetime. Yeah? Because we do have these, for a moment we neglect it, but it is there, it is small, but it is there, and this couples dark state to the bright state that generate for you finite lifetime. Yeah? And uh, so what, what the theory can say about this, uh, actually it says that uh, you, you do need some analysis on the, on the overlap matrix element, et cetera, et cetera. It turns out that the most important part, the most the states which are mostly contribute to the imaginary part, are these states in the lower bright, uh, for the lower bright states. It's a close to this maxima of this condition. And therefore, if you can, depending on how close these states to your dark state, you have either longer lifetime or shorter lifetime. But how you can uh, control the position of the states, as I said, there are two knobs. One of them is detuning. Next slide will explain more. On this, there they, they move like this, these two, relative to the dark state. And the second one is omega p, which is the gap between dark state and the bright states. Increasing the omega p, you push both of this curve away and therefore should increase the lifetime. So concerning detuning, it turns out that if you have a red detuning, situation is like this. This comes closer, and you would have a shorter lifetime for the blue detuning opposite. It pushed away, and you have a longer lifetime. And that's exactly what they see. Yeah? Exactly what they see. These points are experimental parts. The curve is theory. So you see here, even theory is more pessimistic than experiments, which is a kind of strange things. But if they don't have lattice, they see that the lifetime, which is 10,000, 100,000 times longer than the life of the excited states in a free space, uh, it's actually constant. It does not depend on detuning. So it's really, indeed, detuning in the same form as what, what they need. And now the last experimental slide is how it depends on the omega p for fixed epsilon. So you fix the form, and now you push these bright states away from the dark state, increasing this gap, omega p, the probe field. Yeah? And then you see, so indeed it grows. So now experiments in the same way, but now experiments a bit more pessimistic than the theory. Yeah, it's, it's normally what happens. So uh, to conclude this largest part, it works. Yeah? Experimentally demonstrating that indeed you generate the barriers of what you expected. Lifetime is, is consistent with what theory predicts. So indeed, these things can be realized. And, it, and it's, it's there. So it's not just a, a theory. Yeah. OK. So now let me briefly go to the other parts, many body and few body. I couldn't say very much about many body, because actually we didn't think much about it. What is written here is a kind of obvious consequences which you immediately figure out itself. First of all, first, it's if you want to have, let's say, populated the first excited band and not the ground one. This is a good model for this. Because if you have harmonic lattice, deep harmonic lattice, because the, the, the band gaps are equidistant, 
if you populate the, the second one, yeah, there is a collisions, energy preserving collisions where they collide, one goes to the ground, lowest bend, another goes to the upper bend. So this, this, but in this case, these two are different energies. So therefore, these collisions are impossible because they are not energy conserving. So you could have, in this case, particles in the first band, not, okay, second, not the, not the lowest, yeah? And this would be stable against collisions. Second, of course, because our dark state has different decomposition in different spaces, you typically have, and this different com composition could have a different scattering uh, um, uh, lengths or, or scattering properties. So you could have a, a kind of Hubbard model with position dependent coupling constants. The problem here, of course, one has to be very careful analyzing what happens in a many body system when you have collisions of atoms in the presence of so many photons. But, but you can argue that it's not so hopeless things. You could have something interesting here. So what I can tell more details about what happens in a few body system if the particle have a dipolar moment, in particular when the two ground states that form the dark state has an op okay, here it's a theory, it's, it's just a simple example. One is up, another down. Yeah? So here up, here down, and therefore if you move your dark state in space, the dipolar moment changes almost, and then suddenly down, and then again up, and moves away. And uh, so it looks like this. Yeah? Uh, what does it interesting for? So if you are now in this region, two particles, let's say two, two particles you have. If they are here, they repel each other. But if one of them in a red area, another in a blue area, they start attracting each other. So you can form a bound state exactly at the slope of your very high potential. And that's indeed numerics what we did shows you that indeed it's possible to make a dimer of that type which sits on the interface between red and blue or even trimer. And even trimer actually energetically more favorable, you can create it earlier, so to say, with increasing dipole-dipole interaction. And actually, the binding energies are actually quite large. Yeah? It's recoil divided by epsilon squared. So you can have very strongly bound pairs of molecules, let's say, or even magnetic atoms, because it's sort of criteria is not so uh, brutal here for dimers. And just to illustrate you what you can get numerically, no experiment. Well, this is a numerical experiment. Yeah, if you have uh, two particles on this interface, of course, you can, they can form bound state here or here. Yeah? And in, gener in general, you will have symmetric and anti-symmetric combination of these two states. You get an odd and even wave functions. And now if you plot the wave function, the modulus of the wave function, where you have sum of odd and even and a difference of odd and even, so that means you must get either this or this, and that's indeed what you see. That's indeed what you see. So you have indeed the state, which is superposition, or this interface bound state on this interface and on this interface. Yeah. So could be interesting, could be some, some effect if you have a many body system, we don't know. We didn't analyze this. But the but, but effect is interesting. OK. So now I go to the last part, to the applications. Yeah? So as I said, the free, obvious, less obvious, is in, in interesting. Yeah? OK. So obvious application as a, as a splitter. Suppose you have some standard optical potential that generate for you a tube, yeah? or cigar long elongated cigar cloud. Now you add this knife, this berry, in the middle. So that means you split this cloud in two parts, which are very close to each other. The distance would be of the order of the size of your original harmonic confinement. Yeah? And these two would be very close to each other. Yeah? And, and that means that the energy scales of your interaction and actually, what is in more interesting, the, the hopping element could be very large. And large hopping element, for example, means that you are not so restrictive in your temperature to see some interesting effects in these sort of systems. Uh, and uh, if you have a pancake, introducing this knife, you can make a double pancake or bilayer, which is very interesting. 
has a very interesting properties if you have a dipolar moment uh, object with a molecule still with a dipolar moment. There are a lot of interest in physics, many body physics that can happen in the systems. Yeah? But this was a, okay, let me just skip this slide with some more details about by, by layer. Second, less obvious, as I said, let's see this peak as a pencil. Yeah? And now if I move this peak in space, yeah, after, uh, with some variable velocity, or very no constant velocity or varying amplitude, you can do both. Probably simple things is moving different velocity, which you can get by simply controlling the phase of the standing wave. Yeah, because the peaks are exactly where standing wave are zeros. Yeah? And, uh, and then, of course, you average this. You do it very fast. Of course, you have periodicity, you know, otherwise you smear it out. Yeah? And, uh, but, then, but then you smear it out, and then you get some average potential. Uh, in principle, that could have uh, the space resolution of the size of this barrier. The work is in progress. So what we did, initially, you have a periodicity lambda over 2. So in this way, what we try, of course, numerically, uh, you actually can generate periodicity lambda over 4, and we check lambda over 6. Yeah? So here it's a bit more complicated because you have to be fast compared to the dark state, typical dark state energies, but you have to be slow compared to the gap to the bright states because otherwise you start coupling this fast Fourier harmonics that's coupling you to the, to the bright state. So that means that you actually have the window of frequencies where numerically looking at these quasi-energies in this kind of flaquet type of system, periodically driven, you really see the block bands that corresponds to lambda over 4 and lambda over, over 6. And actually, you can even do some loading started from the, the one band. You start this extra peaks moving, you start growing, you see how these bands evolving and forming really at the end the band for the lambda over 4, lambda over 6. So at least from the computer this works. Yeah. Yeah. And now finally would be probably the more interesting application. How can we make, how can we scan, how can we probe the wave function, let's say Vanier function, yeah, which sits in a, in a single site in standard optical lattice. Yeah. Idea is the following, idea is very simple. Yeah. This is a lambda system, again, with this position-dependent control field and constant probe field. I now have a different names, but OK, it has some other. So now, when I move in space, when my atom moves in space, yeah, it changes its internal state. It's most of the time, it is in here, and only in these very narrow regions, let me call it focusing regions, atom flipping internal states into this one. Yeah? So therefore, if I have state selecting measurements, and if I detect an atom in this state, I know where it is. With a subway wave resolution, I know that the atom sits in this particular spot with a subway length size. And this is indeed this way. So you just need to detect the atoms in the R state, and then you know where it is. And this is indeed was done, and again, in JQ and East, and Trey Porter and, and, and Steve Rolston experiments. So what they do is exactly like this. So if you have the wave function, they just raise this barrier in one place and, the, and, and therefore convert the atoms, which are, they can do it very fast, convert the atoms that are in this narrow region to the different quantum state, to R, and then they do time of flight and they do state selective measurements. And they know how many atoms was there. So they know the square of the wave function. Of course, the sample is gone. But you can repeat and repeat and repeat and scan in a different position. You really can scan the models of the wave function doing many types of repeating this experiment. So if your repetition rate is very high, who cares? You just switch it for the night. You go sleeping, coming back, and you have the wave function, yeah? the models of the wave function. Uh, but unfortunately, this is destructive. So we analyze a different possibility, how you can do continuous, continuous measurement without destructing the system. Of course, there would be back action of the measurement on the system. But this has a very, actually, interesting uh, uh, features. Uh, so the idea is, indeed, 
you are in a R state in a very narrow region. But now, let me consider another, suppose I now put this system in, a, well, we think about optical cavity, maybe there are some other methods. You put it in an optical cavity, which has its own eigenmodes for the light. And suppose one of the modes of the cavity, or cavity eigenmode, is close to the transition from this state, atomic state, to another atomic state. Yeah? So that means the cavity mode, this transition, very strongly coupled, but dispersively, to the cavity mode. So therefore, when atom go to this focusing region where it converts to these things, cavity mode fills it. So for the, for the cavity mode, for the cavity, it looks like you change the electric constant. So that means you change the resonant frequency. This atom changes the resonant frequency of the cavity mode. And this you can measure. Yeah? in a homodyne measurement. So what you do, I just briefly, uh, so here is the setup. You have the cavity, driven cavity, incoming field, outgoing field. You m mix it with some, what is called, uh, oscillator, a local so oscillator with some classical field, another laser here. And what you measure here, you measure the second term. So you can measure in this way photocurrent that carries information about the phase of the phase shift of the light that passes through the cavity. And depending whether the atom is in the focusing region or out, so it's or in the one state or in another, change of the phase of the light that goes out would be different, and the photocurrent would be different. So therefore, absorbing the photocurrent, in principle, you can absorb the, the presence of the atom in, 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 this, in this state. Yeah? So that is, that is sort of the idea. It is very rich system. So here, it all very much depends on the parameters, how the cavity line with and the, the, the frequency. So it's, 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 it's an interesting mode, this system. The last slide I want to present you, that's numerical simulations for this conditional stochastic mass equation that describe this pro conditional because you have to know how the measured current affect the evolution of the system. There is, of course, the back action of the measurements all the time. Yeah? Because you measure, you project, you know the state and how it's now your, your evolution. Yeah, OK. So what is in these plots, it is single atom, single atom in a harmonic confinement. An initial state is chosen as a, a temperature state. Yeah? With the temperature is, I think, I, uh, one fifth of the, of the omega of the trap frequency. So there is a probability to be in a zero state and ground state of the harmonic oscillator, in a first excited state, and in a second. And, and the rest, we just ignore, because they are very small. Yeah? And now this was occupation. So it's a density matrix. This is diagonal. This is occupation of the ground state, first excited state, and, and the, the second. And now you start moving your focusing function. It's where the atoms are converted into different internal states. Yeah? And then initially, you don't see anything because the, this focusing function outside, so on the exponential tail of the wave function, nothing happens. And now you see now starts things happening. Yeah, because the measured photocurrents action has a measurement has a back action on the evolution of your system. Now you see something going on. And now you see the collapse of the initial state to a particular eigenstate of the harmonic oscillator. Yeah. So in this case, it's a ground state. And this is photocurrent, what measures photocurrent. And this is what you should expect if the atom's in the ground state. But then, what is kind of example in the textbooks for quantum mechanics? Now quantum jump happens as a result of the measurement. System suddenly goes from the ground state to the first excited states as a result of this back action of the measurement. Each time you get a different curves, this was chosen because it's interesting. Yeah? Because, yeah. And now remains in the first excited states. You move further, but you see the atom wants to go somewhere, but it's not enough strength to go. It stays in the first excited states. And then you see this is for the current what measures. And that's what it should be if the atom in the first excited state. So you see the photocurrent, homodyne current, homodyne current reproduces the density profile of your wave function. Now you stop here, it's outside. And then with this initial condition, that means in a first excited state, you do the second scan, you repeat. And then you see system stays, stay, stay in a first excited state. There is some attempts to change, but it remains there. And then 
at the end of this scan, practically, another quantum jump happens to the ground state. Yeah? And this is the corresponding homodyne current. And this is what you expect for the density profile. Yeah? So this is all continuous measurement. Yeah? Just you do the experiment and see your homodyne current. And you don't destroy your system. You, of course, modify it because it now has a quantum jump with different quantum states. Now we jump into the ground state. Yeah? And then you are out there. Nothing happens because your focusing region is outside the wave function. Now you repeat again the scan. Now with these boundary conditions that your system is in the ground state. Huh? You do the third scan. And then you see system remains. Now here where the most of the wave function is, you see there is a strong attempt to change the quantum state, but it's successful. Huh? So in the edge system still remains in the ground state. And this is what you see in the photocurrent and that you should expect knowing the wave function. So in, it, it, you see that the lambda system allows you to do such uh, crazy things. Yeah? If you have a very good cavity, so in principle, this is possible. So this is my kind of light, uh, last uh, informative slides. This is conclusion. It sounds, of course, should be optimistic. Yes, otherwise, yeah. So indeed, this, this lambda optical lambda system uh, allows you to create these optical potentials, which are kind of very narrow and very high. And this can have several usage. Yeah? It just depends on your fantasy, depending on your experimental setup. Yeah? And, and, and this is important because it's, it's, it's working thing. So it was realized in experiments. This is always good for theorists yeah? because then experimentalists start trusting you. Yeah? That's sort of things can go on. But this is really, there are many experimental proposals in that size. So we need a brave experimentalist. Okay. So that's all, and thank you for your attention.